Hi everyone, I'm Bruce from Team Artist's Journey and I'm here to welcome you before we bring Nancy on. And if you haven't already, download the class workbook. The workbook will help you follow along and we're going to get started in just a minute. And I know that you're here today because you want to learn from Nancy. But now, let's get started. Nancy Hillis is a best-selling author of the award-winning book, The Artist's Journey, Bold Strokes to Spark Creativity, and founder of the Artist's Journey courses and workshops, who has helped over 22,000 artists and creatives believe in themselves in their art and life. Nancy's first book was named one of the top creativity books of all time by Book Authority. She's an artist, Stanford-trained psychiatrist and speaker, and has been featured in Inc. Magazine as well as the New York Observer. But my favorite way to introduce Nancy Hillis is this. Uh, so Dr. Nancy Hillis is a Stanford-trained psychiatrist um, but she's also very passionate about helping authors. She's been featured in Inc. Magazine and the New York Observer. She lives in Santa Cruz, California, right near me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this. So if you can all give her a big round of applause and welcome up Dr. Nancy Hillis. Much Bruce. In case you all don't know, Dr. Bruce Sawhill is my partner. He's a Stanford educated theoretical physicist and we have great fun writing a blog together. We also have a great love for music. Bruce is an organist and I play the cello and our daughter Kimberly plays cello, transcribes and composes cello music and sings opera. And sometimes we all play together. We used to joke that we're like the Von Trapp family from The Sound of Music, only much smaller. Here's what we will accomplish in this webinar. We're going to identify the three massive mistakes that are frustrating you, causing you pain, and leaving you feeling stymied, stalled, and repetitive in your art. Then we're going to find the opportunity within the challenge, the big idea that is hiding in plain sight. I'm going to give you a mind-shifting method that will transform not only your art, but also your experience of creating it. It's vital for you to get this information because it's a game changer in how you'll think about creating your art going forward. Here's how this information has changed people's lives. Like Lorraine Willis, who experienced enormous liberation and confidence in her art. After implementing my methods and teachings, Lorraine had two paintings selected for a prestigious exhibition near Paris. As you know, Studio Journey opened up my life as an artist and I actually, at that point, gave myself a permission to call myself an artist. And through that, um, things started to evolve and develop. And we let, uh, let go, we tried some very new things, we uh, looked at the adjacent possible, what's going to happen if you take that and it moves on, what does it give you. One day I met a totally inspirational international ceramicist called uh, Jacques Dumery. He happened to be staying um, in a gite of a friend of mine and she mentioned that she had a friend who was an abstract artist and he said can I see some of her work? So she showed him my work and he said wow this is amazing. Um, he said she needs to be in the exhibition in Orléans. And I was a bit sort of gobsmacked, to be honest with you, because this exhibition is just like the real artists, you know, big professional, really good artists. And um, he was chatting to him and he said, no, he said, well, you know, we'll put you forward next year. And early this year, but, um, he phoned me up and he said, uh, I want you to uh, submit some pieces for, for the exhibition in Orléans. The maximum number of pieces you could put forward, you could submit, were five. And so I created five pieces and lo and behold, I got a, a letter back to say that two of my pieces had been accepted and it was like amazing. Normally, the first time you apply, it's impossible to get in. To have two pieces accepted, he said, was extraordinary. If it hadn't been for Studio Journey, I wouldn't have been on that journey and I would never have had, I would never have had the confidence to have put something forward like that uh, to an exhibition like that. I think for me it was, it couldn't have been um, anything better at the right time. It sort of lit something inside of me and it changed me. You know, suddenly I became someone who, you know, who 
wanted to get into the studio and wanted to try and you know wanted to actually start these things and then just see where I ended up now I now no longer care what anybody says or thinks I've no not at all not at all she did all of this by implementing this method I'll be showing you today in this webinar I'm committed to playing all out holding nothing back revealing to you the big idea you can implement and start seeing results from in your art in the next 48 hours. In exchange, I ask you to be committed to also playing all out, being fully attentive and really focusing on what I'm showing you, and repeatedly throughout the webinar, taking the information I offer, noticing if you feel any resistance, and going forward anyway and asking yourself, how can I apply this in my art and life? Because that's the best way to make rapid change. I'll do everything I can to maximize the value you get out of our limited time together, and I promise to show you how you can learn more. The old way of creating art isn't working. It's rule-bound, it's formulaic, it's predictable. It says, if you just have more techniques, you'll be great. It's riddled with self-doubt, inner criticism, second guessing, perfectionism, and the tyranny of technique. You struggle with starting, with ideas, with repeating yourself, copying others, getting stuck in the middle, frozen, fearing ugly art, finishing, and so forth. The new way, a new approach to solving these problems, this predicament, is a game-changing mindset shift that will transform your art and your experience of creating it. And it's this. I call this the big idea. It's something I've been developing and thinking about and implementing for years. I asked myself, if you could distill it down to just a few things that make it or break it for you in your art, and your life for that matter, what are those things? What is that process? What is the elegant solution? And I realized that it really has to do with one overarching concept. What we're essentially talking about is the inner journey. The big idea is that the inner journey affects everything. Your mindset, your psychology, your belief and trust in yourself or lack thereof affects your art, your creativity, your life. It has far reaching implications and potential consequences. It's so important in your art that I call it the Holy Grail. And that's because it affects three vital studio practices that I believe are at the core of creating as an artist. By learning these three practices, you'll overcome inhibitions, activate your creativity, never run out of ideas, fall in love with painting again, create paintings that wow you. And it's based on science, psychology, and research in creativity. I ask myself, what are the few things you need to do consistently as an artist to transform your art? And I found that there are three massive mistakes artists are making even professional artists that are standing in the way of creating art that wows you, art that is alive and art that you love. But before we get into those, I want to tell you a story. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to live my most creative and meaningful life, to say yes to my dreams. And it's been a struggle and perhaps you can relate to this. When I was 17, I was depressed and grappling with existential angst. I was bored with school. 
So I stayed home and read The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, in particular, The Inferno. And Dante spoke to me across seven centuries. The opening lines from The Inferno gave me hope. In the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood, and the true way was wholly lost. Those words helped me to not feel alone. Dante was stepping into the unknown, and I was too. Soon something called me. It was medicine. And the day I finished all my training, something else called me. The siren call of art in the form of sculpture. And pretty soon, one thing unfolded into the next, and I was drawing figures, painting watercolors, oil still life and landscapes, collage, mixed media. And I knew I wanted to go more and more abstract into abstract expressionist works. I love Cy Twombly, Joan Mitchell, Helen Frankenthaler, and I wanted to paint like that. I found myself trying to replicate the work I loved, but ultimately this was a dead end. I felt bored. There were times when it was such a struggle. I got really busy in my life and my art floundered. I wasn't expressing the paintings I wanted to express and I felt like giving up, but something in me just couldn't give up. There comes a day when you face yourself in your darkest, deepest doubts when you wrestle down the dark angels of angst and despair. Because the deeper truth I discovered was that I wanted to paint like me. I wanted to explore the reaches of my own imagination. One of the lessons I've learned over the years in being an artist, as well as working with artists in workshops and classes, is that being an artist is ultimately an inner journey. While we learn concepts, principles, and techniques, we find out that these are guides, but they are not the thing itself. To get to our deepest work, it's about stepping into the unknown. It's about adopting an attitude of not knowing. It's about cultivating exploration and experimentation. And it's about moving closer and closer to our own self-expression. Technique is valuable, but it's only there as a tool to support our expression. We don't lead with technique. This is a big shift artists come to, sometimes after years of focusing on rules, constructs, and techniques. The dark night of the soul, when you face yourself and wrestle down your darkest, deepest doubts. You wrestle down the dark angels of despair and you see that on the edge of that dark night is the transformation of ultimately trusting yourself. And that's a whole new journey. Can you relate to this aha moment of wanting to finally paint like you? So finally, one day, I discovered how to make that transformation in my art. And that's what I'm going to teach you today. I'm going to show you how you can learn about everything I did to create that amazing transformation that's changed over 22,000 artists' lives in addition to my own. We've been looking at the problem of trying to get to your most meaningful art in a totally wrong way because it's not really a problem, but rather an opportunity. If you want to open up creative channels, move past resistance and feel freed up and liberated in your art, trusting your own voice and vision, here are the principles, strategies, mindsets, and concepts that will help you get there. I'm going to show you the big idea and the foundational concepts and practices from the intersections of creativity, science, evolutionary biology, mathematics, and psychology of creating your most surprising, astonishing, experimental work as an artist. The big idea is that it's about your inner journey. Creating art is an inside job. Whether you're at the beginning of your journey or a seasoned professional with your work in galleries and museums, the big secret I learned is that your inner landscape your inner dialogue, your mindset, 
is your most important asset because it affects everything. It affects your ability to face your fears and self-doubt and go ahead anyway. It affects your ability to start creating, to move through the messy middle and to decide when to finish your painting. It affects your ability to take risks, play, explore, and experiment in your art. It affects your ability to keep going when you get frustrated. It affects your ability to tolerate ugly art. This inner journey is about trusting yourself, developing a growth mindset, the sense that your possibilities for growth and improvement are limitless and infinite, and exploring and noticing your inner narrative, learning ways to speak to yourself that promote curiosity, inquiry, and a positive, supportive approach to challenges. This is about noticing the fears and self-doubt that arise and addressing this in a mindful and positive way. Asking yourself, what if I trusted myself in this moment with this painting? By imagining the possibility of trusting yourself, you face your fears, face the dark night of the soul, the moment of greatest self-doubt, and just by wrestling down those dark angels of despair and doubt, you strengthen your ability to believe in yourself. There's a wonderful concept from Carol Dweck's work at Stanford on growth versus static mindset. In a growth mindset, the attitude is, I can grow. I can get better at this. I can practice more and I'll improve. There's no limit to what I can achieve. Whereas in a static mindset, the attitude is talent is limited to a few. There's a cap on what you can achieve based on your inherent abilities. And you easily give up when frustrated and think it means you're not good enough. So you can see it's so important to develop a growth mindset. And then we have the inner dialogue. The words you use, the words you say to yourself matter. There was research at Columbia University where they were looking at people giving a speech. And this is something that tends to bring up anxiety for people. And what they found is that the ones who used the first person personal pronouns such as I didn't do so well. They would say things to themselves like, I'm nervous. I don't know if I'll do well. Whereas the ones who use second or third person pronouns, which creates more distance, such as we or using your name, saying something like, we can do this, or calling out your name, such as Daniel, you've got this. They found that these people did better who used the more distancing pronouns. So the overarching concept is that the inner landscape the inner narrative reflects your inner journey. And your inner journey affects everything in your art and life. It's your most valuable asset. And there's more we explore in my teachings and offerings, but you get the idea of where we're going with this. So let's turn now to the three massive mistakes artists make that cause them to not like their art to not be wowed by their art. In fact, they may be feeling disillusioned with their art. So we'll start with mistake number three. Massive mistake number three, painting paralysis. This is a condition where an artist is so afraid of making mistakes that she fails to start. The fear of doing something wrong overtakes the desire to create something. To start is to quite literally begin. It is to cause to come into being. The problem is that you simply don't start or you simply don't paint enough. You're not painting miles of canvas. It takes everything you've got to start one painting. And then you, you get hung up on one painting, making it precious. You take that one painting and work it to death. You may even work on one painting for months and then you're devastated when you don't love it, when it flops, when it's murky and muddy and it's, and it's lost that feeling of aliveness you had in the beginning. And pretty soon, you're avoiding your art altogether because it's so painful. 
Here's a story. Years ago, I painted plein air landscapes. Once a week, I'd meet with a group of artists and set up my easel and paint one to three panels in a three to four hour lesson. If I had a great session, I noticed that the next week that I'd feel anxious and worried about whether I could replicate last week's success. The pressure mounted and sometimes I dreaded going there and facing the easel. How would the painting turn out? I knew I'd be devastated if the painting was a dud. This tension sucked the pleasure out of painting, and sometimes I'd avoid painting altogether. I simply wasn't painting enough, and therefore I couldn't get traction. What I didn't know then, that I do know now, is that the pros paint a lot. The Museum of Modern Art in New York estimates that Picasso created over 20,000 works of art. So this is a sample from module one of my new course, Studio Journey Masterclass, and I'm teaching you elements from it, and I'll be telling you more about that later on. So what is the solution to this mistake? The solution is to start. So let's start with start. There's a concept from mathematics called zero to one. This is the idea that the interval from zero to one is larger than any other interval. It's larger than one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on. It's going from nothing represented by zero to something represented by one, rather than from something to something, two to three, three to four, and so on. To go from Nothing to something is an enormous thing. Imagine that you've been avoiding your studio. It's been a few days. The last time you were in there, you created a painting you thought was horrid. Not wanting to repeat that experience, you find other activities to distract you. And the longer you wait, the harder it is to show up. This is where zero to one comes in. If you can say to yourself, Let's just go in there and mix some paint, zero to one. Maybe I'll explore mixing to get variations on citrine, zero to one. If you can say that to yourself and remind yourself that it's about starting, starting something, anything, this will help you get back in there into your art. This is not about creating a masterpiece. This is about starting and you can start anywhere. And realizing it's a freeing, liberating, and miraculous thing to just begin. One of the ways we play with zero to one in painting is by creating many painting starts. We call it lots of starts. And pretty soon, we're creating a series of starts. And why is this important? Well, by beginning, by creating lots of starts, we open up creative channels that lay dormant. We access unfettered self-expression. We move past creative blocks that hold us back and make us avoid our art. By creating lots of starts, we create a sense of permission, of allowing, of opening up exploratory mark making, loosening up our art, cultivating playfulness and exploration. And all of this helps move us past avoidance and procrastination. And we do this in spades in my teachings and lessons. Because if you don't start or allow for lots of starts, the danger is that you'll begin to avoid your art or you'll be increasingly frustrated because your art is not progressing. And worst of all, you may decide to give up entirely on your art. So here's a tip for you to employ in your studio. Over the next 48 hours, go into your studio and create three to 10 painting starts. Take out sheets of paper and create three to 10 stream of consciousness mark-making starts. Don't censor, 
don't judge, don't edit. Just allow for exploratory mark making. You may decide to do this to music, as in the example from this clip. This is about starting. Then pick out one or two starts that you would like to work up further and do that. And keep the rest of the starts raw and let them live as is. This is a great exercise for accessing your own gestural expression, your own particular and unique lexicon of mark making. Sound good? Great! Now on to massive mistake number two, licking the paint. Licking the paint is when you're not confident enough to make decisive moves in your art. So instead you make timid adjustments, hoping to create a masterpiece. I see this mistake often. It manifests not only in licking the paint, but also in a reliance upon technique to create successful paintings. Technique is a false idol. Let's talk about the tyranny of technique. This is where artists look outside of themselves for answers, for a step-by-step -step recipe for their paintings, emulating others and looking for validation of their art through critique and praise. The danger is painting by committee, art that is boring and soulless. It's the lowest common denominator art. These artists believe they'll become a great artist once they learn all the techniques. Another variation on this is that if they buy all the tools and supplies, they'll get better at art. And so they go from workshop to workshop, technique to technique. For years, it's like the search for the Holy Grail. They think that art is technique. But one day, they realize that art is not technique because no amount of technique has gotten them closer to expressing their deepest art. They take all these technique classes and their paintings look like everyone else's, repetitive and formulaic. They could take a hundred technique courses and still not create the paintings of their dreams. And the reason is that technique is painting from the outside in rather than the inside out. It's like instead of focusing on the big ideas and the big concepts and principles such as the root and the trunk of the tree, metaphorically, they paint the leaves and think if they just paint enough of these details of these leaves and little branches that it will all knit together. But it doesn't work like that. We're all about coming from the deeper foundational concepts that can inform your art and allow you to express your own true art. Here's a story. For years, I pursued technique. I thought if I just learned the right technique, I'd finally make paintings that wowed me and my viewers. But it was an elusive thing. And before I knew it, my paintings looked strategic contrived, as if I was following a cookbook formula. Eventually I got bored. The paintings, while technically good, just didn't move me emotionally. One day I had a breakthrough. I was fed up with repetitive paintings. I was tired of looking outside myself for the answers. I had a dream of continuous line. I went in and decided to create exploratory studies of minimal line and marks. I created a 26-piece assemblage of studies and was at first uncomfortable. They didn't look finished. And yet, I realized that they had an immediacy and aliveness that I had previously never attained. I allowed them to just be, to live as is. This was an enormous breakthrough for me. I also realized the power of working in a series rather than making one painting precious. 
And most importantly, I realized the power of experimentation. Let's talk about the power of experimentation. The mark of being an artist is being one who experiments continuously, not resting on your laurels, not satisfied with the status quo. It's about stepping into the unknown. I love this quote by Michael Cutlip, an artist in Berkeley, California. He said, when I go into my studio, if I already know what's going to happen, it's all over. He also said, a painting must be free to wander. And Hung Lu said, my best paintings are always tomorrow's paintings, not today's. So it's about embracing mistakes and the unpredictable, such as ugly paintings, because there are surprise benefits of ugly art. And this is how I think about ugly art. Ugly art is often the nascent embryonic form of new work emerging, new art trying to be born. An astonishing series of paintings an entire body of work may emerge out of these embryonic forms. A powerful way to access experimentation is to ask yourself the question, what if? Allow your mind to both wonder and wander. Allow it to ask, what if I try this? What if I try that? Whatever it is, it could be exploring a rectilinear Cartesian grid understructure. It could be bulbous shapes. It could be a one color palette. It could be anything that evokes excitement or meaning or aliveness for you. Why is experimentation important? Becoming a great artist is about the movement of coming closer and closer to who you are. It's about reaching the fullest expression of who you are in your art. The answer is not technique. No amount of technique will get you there. Technique is only there to facilitate expression, but it is not expression itself. You cannot lead with technique. What takes you there is the willingness to experiment, which is based on trusting yourself. Here's what happens to artists who avoid experimentation. Their art stagnates. It becomes boring and predictable. Worst of all, the artist begins to doubt herself and feel like an imposter. But you are in this workshop and I congratulate you for being here. So here's a tip. In your workbook, write down quickly without thinking one to five things that pop into your mind that you'd like to try in your art. And you could do this after the webinar or now if something pops into your mind. There's a power in listening to the creative impulse. Sometimes it's subtle. Note down anything you'd like to try. Start with the question, what if? You'll see it at the top of the exercise sheet and list one to five things that comes to your mind quickly. Sound good? Great. Okay, we've been sitting for quite some time now, and the next part is absolutely critical. So right now, I invite you to stand up and stretch your body, and I'll do it with you as well. So now it's time for the number one mistake artists make, and it begins with a story. After years of painting figures, landscapes, and abstract expressionist paintings, I understood the importance of many starts, miles of canvas, working in a series, not licking the paint, moving past emulating others, and deeply experimenting. And yet, I still found myself creating art that did not wow me. I still wasn't loving my art. And I kept wondering why, what is it that I'm not understanding? What is the missing piece? What is going on here? And I almost gave up until I had a conversation with my partner, Dr. Bruce Sawhill, 
Stanford-educated theoretical physicist and mathematician who revealed to me a concept from science that shook my world and transformed my art into art I loved, art that wowed me. I think of it as the Sawhill secret. Do you want to know what it is? It's about how creating art is about continually evolving. Not only starting and experimenting, but continuing to evolve your art. This is a game changer for creating astonishing art, art that wows you. And it relates intimately to mistake number one, empty virtuosity. Empty virtuosity, this is a success disaster. This is when an artist mines a vein of high-grade ore until it's completely exhausted, after which she finds herself empty-handed and at the bottom of a deep hole. In essence, she repeats herself in her art and in the process loses sight of possibility. So this is the situation when the artist has moved past paralysis and past looking outside of herself and emulating others' work, just when she thinks she's got that solved and she's on her way with deep experimentation, this is when she hits mistake number one. This is when the artist repeats, not others, but herself. The danger of winning of creating successful, astonishing art is the danger of repeating oneself. This is almost the same situation as before. The artist is still falling back on repeating, still falling back on what the artist thinks is the solution, the formula of what works. And paradoxically, the artist is no longer living at that edge of stepping into the unknown, no longer creating astonishing art anymore. This is the mining metaphor. If one mines the vein to the last shovelful, one then finds oneself at the bottom of a very deep hole with nothing left. The artist takes her success and drives it into the ground through repetition. She takes it down to death. The artist becomes so focused on success that she loses curiosity, discovery, and expressiveness in the flash. So what is the solution? What is the Sawhill secret? The adjacent possible framework. The adjacent possible framework is about evolving your art. The essence of being an artist is continually evolving your art. One form unfolds into the next. It's like being in a river. It's ever changing and it never ends. What we're talking about is the big mama of all practices. The groundbreaking concept from theoretical evolutionary biology formulated and articulated by my partner, Dr. Bruce Sawhill, as well as Dr. Stuart Kaufman at the Santa Fe Institute in the early 90s. The adjacent possible. And I'm going to apply the adjacent possible concept to creativity itself. So the adjacent possible is the idea that each step you take illuminates a number of possible paths forward that were not only invisible before, but did not exist before. Because your action changes the environment you're in. It's co-evolution. It's co-creation. It's akin to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in theoretical physics, where the act of observing changes what's being observed. While in the adjacent possible, your act of creating affects existence itself. It's mind-blowing. So every move you make on your canvas is opening up the next possibility, the adjacent possible, 
that would not exist if you had not made that move. Do you see that this is about continually evolving your art, continually unfolding into the adjacent possible, continually creating a new reality with your art? I think this is one of the most exciting concepts. Can you imagine yourself exploring this in your art? What we're talking about is cultivating surprise. You simply don't know what's going to happen next. And that makes for astonishing, unpredictable, unique art. Art from you, your gestures, your experiences, your impulses. It's a mind-blowing Big Mama concept. So why is evolving your art, the adjacent possible framework, important? Being an artist is about continually evolving your art, allowing it to unfold and not be reduced down to prescription or formula. It's about reaching for your fullest self-expression and getting to the elusive deepest work we crave to do. It is about continually stepping into the unknown, into the adjacent possible, and cultivating surprise. This is where the most astonishing art comes from. It is the essence of creativity. Indeed, it is the science of creativity. Evolution has two parts, experimenting and selecting. And selecting is connected with decision. Without either one of them, it doesn't work. And there are no experiments without starts. So it's all connected. Start, experiment, evolve. And do you see, we began with the inner journey, I, and then we have start, experiment, and evolve, I see. It is not about copying others or yourself. That's a dead end. The danger of not employing the adjacent possible framework is that you spend years trying to figure out why your art does not excite you. Meanwhile, your art stagnates. You feel bored. You have a lack of enthusiasm for your art. You lose confidence. You repeat what's worked before as you fall back into safe art. Your art becomes predictable, formulaic, and you're simply not reaching your dreams of that elusive, deepest art you crave. Here's a story of an artist who did not know how to access the adjacent possible framework in her art. So an artist finally began to trust herself and cultivate exploration and experimentation. And she thought she was on her way now. She told herself, you've got this only to find that the siren call of so-called success reeled her back in with its clinging tentacles, beckoning her to repeat her successes, repeat what has worked before. She had sold out her solo exhibition. She was on a roll now, and she found herself wanting to repeat what she did there. Because, hey, it was experimental. It was surprising and astonishing, she told herself. And then she thought, maybe I can repeat that. I call this the nibulator. It nibbles at artists. It sort of carves out an adjacent piece and runs with that. It's barely distinguishable from what the artist did before. The reality is that it is hard to paint in a brand new direction for every exhibition. But if an artist can continually evolve at the edge of that work, and not sit on it in repetition, not just simply repeat it with slight variations ad infinitum. The artist thinks, I'm on a roll here, I'm winning. But unbeknownst to her, it's a Faustian deal. Pretty soon, the artist has developed a body of work that is relatively indistinguishable from the last work she did. And she's essentially circling. She's repeating not someone else's art, but rather her own. This woman was so frustrated, she tearfully told me she felt like a fraud, not a real artist. She knew that her paintings, though successful, were predictable and looked formulaic. 
She was losing her love for her art, and she felt like giving up. Can you see how this is a dead end? When artists hold on to their successes, even though they've started to stretch into the unknown, into experimentation, this tendency to fall back on the known, the familiar, the winning formula is seductive but deadening. Another danger is that you spend tens of thousands of dollars looking for the answers in tools and techniques, trying to learn how to make art you love. And lastly, perhaps worst of all, the danger is that you reach a point of such deep frustration that you throw your hands up in resignation, giving up on creating the art of your dreams. You must learn to evolve your art. Specifically, you must learn the science of creativity, which is the adjacent possible framework. If you don't, you may make it to the experimentation stage in your art, but you'll miss out on the most important evolving your art part that will take your art to the stratosphere of wow, to that place of continuing evolution. I know so many artists running around, working hard on their art, trying tools, trying techniques, trying to create art that stands out, wasting thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours of precious time on tools, techniques, and strategies that don't work. They desperately want the excitement of creating art they love. They want to express themselves and share their art with the world and feel proud of it. But without mastering evolving their art, specifically the adjacent possible framework, they'll never find what they are looking for. Please remember, you are an artist. You are here to express your deepest, most meaningful art. Art that is dynamic, alive, and evolving. I've seen many, many artists struggle to create art they love art that is unique to them and get fed up and feel like giving up as artists because they didn't know how to access the adjacent possible effectively. They hit a plateau. The creative impulse is calling them, nudging them to take the next step, to step into the unknown, but they're scared and so they turn their face away. They refuse. They retreat back to the safety of the known. And even though they sometimes put their toe in the waters of experimentation, they're not really evolving their art. And it's tragic because it doesn't have to be this way. That's why I've combined my decades of education at the intersections of art, science, creativity, medicine, and psychiatry. All my training and experience and my entire heart and soul to create a program called Studio Journey Masterclass. At this point, I'd love to share with you a little bit about the program while still giving you some great adjacent possible framework tips that you can use right away in your art. Here's how you can get your hands on the Studio Journey Masterclass program. The Studio Journey Masterclass is a hands-on online home learning program with a combination of online training and live group coaching breakthrough calls that gives you the concepts, principles, and methods you need to create the art of your dreams, your most alive and meaningful art. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to come with me on this inner journey and accessing the adjacent possible in your art so you can finally trust and believe in yourself as an artist, express you in your art, and create paintings you love. By the end of 12 weeks, you will be able to not only experiment in your art, but evolve your art. Why is this important? because you'll be one of the few artists that knows how to not only experiment, but also evolve your art. 
by understanding and accessing the adjacent possible framework. The adjacent possible framework that guides you to create art that excites you, art that scares you, art that wows you, and art you're not bored with. And the adjacent possible framework moves you past success catastrophe, that naughty and deadly problem of repeating yourself, repeating your successes, that problem that few people talk about. I have developed a comprehensive abstract painting program based on principles from the intersection of art, science, psychology, and creativity research. This program was created to enhance your own creativity and creative well-being by implementing a few simple research-based methods to your own life and art. We share surprising and inspiring stories that will forever alter the way you think about creativity. We're going to get at the foundations, again, like the roots and trunk of the tree, rather than the leaves and the small branches. I've researched and honed down years of knowledge from art, psychology, creativity, science, and mathematics to bring you the most exciting, unique, and comprehensive program that will simplify complicated concepts into understandable lessons that you can access with ease. I've figured out how to simplify such complicated fields as the study of color, as well as composition and value in a way that makes it easy for you to create your own unique art with excitement and confidence. You'll be able to take these concepts and create art you love, art that astonishes you, art that is experimental, art that expresses you. I've told you about the overarching concept of the inner journey and the three big practices that will transform your art. There's a great deal more to this to learn in order to create the art of your dreams, art that expresses your own voice and vision, such as intuitive composing, simplifying values, color contrast, and more. So let's review what we've covered so far. We talked about the big idea of the inner journey, and this includes trusting yourself, developing a growth mindset, and exploring your inner narrative. We also discovered three massive errors, three massive mistakes artists make. Painting paralysis, licking the paint, and empty virtuosity. We discovered the three foundational practices for creating astonishing art. Start, zero to one. Experiment, the surprise benefits of ugly art. Evolve, the adjacent possible framework. And let's talk about the benefits of each of these practices. Trusting yourself. Develop a sense of allowing. You'll be able to create with aliveness, scrappiness, zest, confidence, playfulness, and ease. Growth mindset. You'll cultivate an attitude of possibility. Inner narrative. Quieting the inner critic and learning how to encourage yourself. Start zero to one. You begin to develop a practice that makes starting easier, both in your art and life. Experiment. The surprise benefits of ugly art, opening up unlimited creative channels. Evolve. The adjacent possible framework bringing visibility to the invisible, shining light around corners, noticing what you'll pursue from experimentation. So I'd like to ask you for a commitment from you to move forward. 
first, I'd like to ask you to complete the workbook assignment within the next 48 hours. And secondly, doing so is going to get you an experience of loosening up your artwork, developing an attitude of allowing and embracing the unknown, a joy and ease and experimentation and cultivating surprise, as well as embracing ugly art because you know how important it is. But you still need more. Even though everything I just taught you is great, it will only take you part way to creating the paintings you love, paintings that astonish you. You still need to understand the game changers of value and value contrast, compositional principles and how to compose intuitively, the principles of simplicity and constraint, which we know from science, and how this strengthens your art and how to simplify color and work with color contrast, the power of maquettes or little studies and more in order to succeed. At this point, you have a choice. You can continue to go it alone, but the question is, where has that gotten you thus far? You've known that you need to do this for quite a while, and perhaps you haven't done much to get there. We've probably accomplished more on this webinar than most people accomplish in months working alone. So yes, you can totally do this on your own, or you can get the help you need from me as an expert, as someone who has done all of this, who has developed a systematic program to help you do it faster, easier, and with more confidence. Wouldn't you like to have that in your art and life? So by having this expert guidance, I can give you the help you need to circumvent big challenges, wasted time, and all the frustrations and complications that you would encounter if you tried to go it alone. I want you to achieve the experience of feeling confident as an artist, trusting yourself in your process, and creating the art of your dreams, art that excites and wows you. So I have some questions for you. Are these things you want in your life? Are you interested in getting there faster? Are you committed to doing what it takes to get them? Are you excited to start creating with confidence? And do you believe it's possible to trust yourself in your art? Is your answer yes? Then it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Studio Journey Masterclass. Studio Journey Masterclass is a hands-on, step-by-step combination of group coaching and online training that gives you the principles and methods and concepts you need to create the art of your dreams, your most alive and meaningful art. So here is what you get. You're going to break through blocks and create more paintings with ease. Discover the surprise benefits of mistakes, experimentation, and ugly art. Discover your own lexicon of mark making and gestural expression. And here's what that means to you. You trust yourself and create with confidence. You open up creative channels, evolving your art and creating paintings you love. And you express your deepest, most meaningful art, expressing the work that only you can create, expressing art that is yours. So here's what you get. 12 modules of art bundles with lectures, reflections, exercises, and 12 weekly full painting demos where I take you through the process of creating a painting and give you insights and tips along the way, abstract painting foundational principles and concepts, video lectures, video exercises, a course portal, 12 full months of access, a private members community, a progress tracker, in a materials list. Here's what you're going to accomplish as a result. 
In Module 0, Studio Start, you will begin your inner journey by developing a vision board, starting an art journal to document your journey, and gathering provisions and supplies for your studio. In Module 1, Working in a Series, you'll learn how to take an idea and expand upon it in an iterative way exploring variations as you experiment deeply and discover more about yourself as you create and evolve your art. In Module 2, we'll explore simplicity and constraint. You'll learn one of the most important foundational concepts for artists and innovators and apply this to your art. In Module 3, Working Large, Staying Loose, when you start a new painting, one of the first decisions you make is what is the scale of the painting? What size will you make it? In particular, we'll explore the siren call of working large and staying loose. In Module 4, Color Contrast, you'll learn how to simplify color by employing visual contrast. By applying this concept, you'll no longer be intimidated by the enormous field and complexity of color. In Module 5, Value Contrast, you'll learn why value is a game changer and how simplifying values can transform your art. In Module 6, Intuitive Composition, we'll simplify this complex subject down to a few things that make 90% of the difference in creating powerful art. In Module 7, Rhythm, we'll explore how rhythm creates a sense of aliveness in our paintings, as well as movement, structure, and elapsed time. We'll explore rhythms in nature and in our bodies, and how to translate underlying rhythmic structures and sequences to the canvas. In Module 8, Structure, we'll add another foundational concept of art to our repertoire. Discover how important it is to have an underlying foundational structure in abstract painting. In particular, we'll explore the grid as well as what I call the organic grid substructure. In Module 9, Shape. We'll explore the rich world of shape, shape contrast, and shape relationships that will help you create visually exciting paintings. In Module 10, Color and Value Relationships, you'll explore the relationship of color and value and how to create powerful paintings with this awareness. In Module 11, Mark Making, you'll create your own personal visual lexicon and vocabulary by exploring experimental mark making. In Module 12, Minimalism, you'll come full circle back to the foundations of simplicity and constraint that threads through this entire journey by stripping away the non-essentials, achieving simplicity, and distilling your art down to its essence. Plus, we have three bonus modules. The Zorn Palette and Abstract Painting. This is a perennial favorite of studio journeyers. Many of my artists return to this bonus module again and again. Variations and contrast. You'll discover the power of endless variations and how you can employ this in your art. Combinatorics and recombinatorics. This is a favorite lesson at my live retreats. This is a concept from mathematics that teaches us that the elements of creation work together in endless combinations, and we'll explore this extensively. So you could try to do this all yourself. You could spend thousands of dollars and years of study trying to piece it all together, which is essentially what I've done here. Or you could attend art school and invest $44,000 for one year, or you could join me and my team of guides as we walk you through step-by-step step, a curated course of study 
that has delivered phenomenal results for artists across the world since 2017. You'll understand the psychology and the science behind the adjacent possible framework, leaving the program with your art transformed so you feel excited and wowed by your art. And all you need to do right now is go to studiojourney.com. I've designed all of the well-crafted video modules. They're easy to follow and they're highly entertaining and they're super engaging and seriously effective. All of the exercises, reflections, painting prompts, and full painting demos, they're all included. They're all eye openers for transforming your art. They're there for you and you can go through the lessons again and again, going deeper with your art. Artists have told me the material is so rich that they discover new things each time they go through the lessons. Studio Journey Masterclass is a 12 module course and includes 10 weekly group live breakthrough sessions with myself and my team of guides walking you through the material. Understanding the underpinnings of creativity through the adjacent possible framework and breathing life into your art. And all you need to do right now is go to studiojourney.com. Now, after you register, you're going to receive an email that will bring you into the course where you'll have immediate access to our introductory module zero, and it's called Studio Start. This is where you'll see our beautiful course, explore and get comfortable with the site, and begin to gather your materials for the course. This is where we'll welcome you and discuss the studio journey philosophy of the inner journey, as well as the adjacent possible framework that threads through all the material. In there, we have a fresh training on the power of documenting your journey through vision boards and art journals. We have a wonderful guest lecturer on this topic, and you'll be able to access this new training as soon as you register. You can contact our client care team at support at nancyhillis.com and they'll answer any and all questions you have. You're not going to be out there floating around. We're happy to get on the phone with you to answer your questions. The team will help you get access to the home learning program and you're going to be well on your way to creating art that excites and wows you. So right now go to studiojourney.com to see your options. There are installment options there if you prefer. Now you may be thinking, this is wonderful, but you're not sure you have enough time. Well, that's why every lesson has been distilled down to the essentials. Like Pareto's law, the 20% of things that make 80% of the difference. We have a tendency to complicate things, but one thing we know from science is that simple is better. We know this from Occam's razor, which is about the simple, elegant solution to explaining something. Many people complicate color. We have a solution to this predicament in the color contrast module, where we simplify color using concepts from simplicity and constraint, so you can use color with confidence and ease. I love this quote from Mark Twain, which gets at the importance of simplicity and constraint. He said, I would have written you a shorter letter, but it would have taken too much time. I think you'll find that Studio Journey Masterclass will save you time, precious time you can give to your art. You might be thinking, well, I don't really know how to paint abstract. Well, a great way to get started is with stream of consciousness mark making and the six Mac hat exercise, which is something we explore in Studio Start at the very beginning. This is a wonderful introduction to abstract expressionism. This is a fabulous lesson where you'll learn how to activate the canvas with stream of consciousness mark making, and then begin the back and forth dance of addition and subtraction, adding, covering, veiling, editing, then activating again, back and forth, an experience very much akin to the life cycle of birth, growth, deterioration and death that we see in nature. So let's talk about the benefits of the Studio Journey Masterclass. Here's what you get. 
break through blocks and create more paintings with ease. Discover the surprise benefits of mistakes, experimentation, and ugly art. Discover your own lexicon of mark making and gestural expression. And here's what that means for you. You trust yourself and create with confidence. You open up creative channels, evolving your art and creating paintings you love. And you express your deepest, most meaningful art, expressing the work that only you can create, expressing art that is yours. And to make sure that this works for you specifically, I'm proud to announce my 14 day money back guarantee. No questions asked. Studio Journey Masterclass is officially available. Simply go to the URL on your screen to begin creating the art of your dreams. Art you love, art that wows you. At this point in this webinar, I bet that the biggest question you have is, is this right for me? And so let me answer that question by saying, this is right for you if you're an artist and you want to express your art, art that is unique to you. You're having challenges in your art. You may find that you're feeling blocked, stuck, stalled out. And you're committed to moving past these blocks. You're an action taker. You care deeply about your art and you want to continue to evolve as an artist. You know that art can change people's lives. This is not for you if you're looking for simple how-to techniques rather than foundational concepts and principles. It's not for you if you want someone to tell you how to paint. If you want formulas and recipes for creating art. If you don't take your art seriously. Or if you're content with your art. And it's not for you if you're not willing to experiment and take risks. Now we've been at this for quite some time and we've got just a few more minutes together. So if anyone has any question about what we've talked about in the presentation or the program itself, I'm happy to answer those questions now. I just told you in this webinar, the big idea underpinning amazing art, and it's really important. But if you try to do this without also understanding constraint and intuitive composing and value without understanding the adjacent possible framework, it will be very difficult. So I invite you in to the amazing Studio Journey Masterclass. I'm so excited that some of you are signing up right now. I can't wait to see you in there. This has been amazing. I'm so grateful to have been here today with you and I'd love to have more time with you in the future. Let's listen to another student of mine who had this to say about Studio Journey. I came across Nancy's online courses and I've uh, been working through her book as well and I think the perspective that she offers as far as you know having art mimic life and life mimic art and so to be able to you know work with somebody who is allowing us to access that you know, deep part of ourselves to express that. So we were we were working with clay and just without thinking too much and that clay was representing you know something very unique to us. There's nobody else who can replicate that. And then we took that piece of clay and we sort of translated sort of the essence of it onto paper. It reflected something that I really liked in the end. Anyways, it, it's, it's knowing that that came from deep within me um, and that it was something that I appreciated yeah, and, and loved. It was, um, it was really meaningful. I hadn't done anything like that before and it just, like the, that process of translating it, it, that allowed me to access. So like when Nancy talks about, you know, creating your deepest art, I felt like this came from the core of who I am, which is why it was so meaningful for me when I looked at it and saw that, oh, this is something that I really liked. Prior to coming to this course, I didn't really feel like I had a signature. I, I didn't really identify as an artist in any way, shape, or form. It's just something that I knew that I loved. I think one of the other one of the other reasons for coming to this course was around not. I didn't want to be afraid to be seen. 
and, 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 and we learn like, to sort of free up our mark making. Um, and so those, you know, working within the construct of those little maquettes and those squares very much allows a different kind of freedom than if you're just, um, you know, staring at a large blank piece of paper. It's, it's a really excellent exercise for loosening up. This has solidified that art needs to be a priority in my life because it helps me understand who I am and, you know, the various challenges that I may face in life. And yeah, it's something I just, it's, I need to keep doing it. You've been on this call all the way up to this point that this is important to you. You've been on it for a long while, and I know that the thought's probably gone through your mind that this looks great, but I don't have the money to invest in this right now. And maybe you're thinking, I'll invest next time this offer comes around. But think about it this way. Where will you be a year from now? You've probably been working on your art for months, even years, because we've already identified that this is important to you. How much progress have you made on your art during that period of time? And here's my question for you. What's going to be different in your life a year from now? My guess is it may not be that different. And in the meantime, during that period of time a year from now, you'll have kept doing things you've been doing for the last year without solving the problem. And so your problem's still going to be there. But let's consider the alternative. Imagine that you invest today in Studio Journey Masterclass. Where will you then be a year from now? Picture yourself having everything this program offers during this year. Can you see what changes you will have made in your life and art during that time? You will have completed many starts. You would have worked in a series. You would be exploring scale. You would be using the adjacent possible framework to evolve your art. You would learn about intuitive composing and get more comfortable and confident with your art. You would learn to bring in concepts from the intersections of math, science, psychology, and creativity to cut through the complexity and, and simplify it down, distill it down, and learn these deep foundational concepts that are game changers for your art. A year from now, you'll be painting and creating with more ease and confidence and joy and excitement than you've seen in years. And these are just a few of the kinds of experiences you're going to have. And ask yourself this question, will my life be better a year from now if I invest today or not? To me, the answer is clear. I have a vision for you to believe in yourself as an artist and to create and to experiment and explore and access the adjacent possible framework and evolve your art and to love and be excited by your art. And I invite you to join me in that vision. I invite you to go to studiojourney.com right now and invest in creating your artistic future. A future of trusting and believing in yourself as an artist and expressing your own unique art, your deepest, most meaningful and alive art with confidence and ease. Something is calling you, your future self, your future art, the possibilities, the adjacent possible of where you can go with your art is calling you. Will you say yes? Will you refuse the refusal? Say yes quickly. Say yes to creating with confidence, to opening up unlimited creative channels, to evolving your art to experiencing a feeling of aliveness, to expressing your legacy, to do what you came here to do in your life and art. Express you in your art. A feeling of aliveness, meaning, creating a legacy, a body of work, trusting yourself, evolving your art, and doing the art you came here to do. Thank you. Thank you for being here.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here. And I saw questions coming in and so I'd love to get to your questions. And so let's get going. Monica writes, when exploring, I find, I often find myself doing different things. I mean, different kinds of paintings. It's a never ending, different styles coming up. And I think that is actually incredibly exciting, Monica. Um, I know that people sometimes get worried about trying to have a particular style. And I'm getting some hot tea right now. I hear. Uh, a lot of people worry about get, having a particular style and trying to find that style and staying within a style. But I would actually argue that you don't have to chase style. You already have within yourself your own particular lexicon, your own particular gestural expression that's unlike anyone else's. So I wouldn't chase style. Uh, your lexicon already is in you. And, and the good news for you, Monica, is that you're exploring all kinds of possibilities and you could take those different ways of going and have various series. I mean, Picasso had all kinds of series and all kinds of movements that he went through. And you can do that over time or you can do that simultaneously. That's up to you. So I, I actually, I embrace that. And I think one of the risks for artists is premature optimization. That is the tendency to crystallize things down too fast to try to come in for a landing, for finishes and all of that. And I think we need to create more starts and fewer finishes. And I think we need to access more experimentation and evolving of our art. So I'm, I'm actually very excited to hear that you have many ways that you are painting. And it sounds very creative to me. Colorful says, I live in a condo. And I don't have much space or studio as to, as to say, this sometimes makes me lazy to bring out my stuff and put it all back every day. Any tips, ideas you can give to handle this better? Well, wow, that's a great question, Colorful, because I think many of us at various times in our life cycle as artists run into space constraints. I've certainly, I have painted in foyers and in, even in bathrooms. Uh, garages, living rooms, kitchens, um, bedrooms, you name it, outside. And what's interesting is paradoxically, I think sometimes that constraint can be a, a good thing to not have the so-called perfect studio. I've got a story where one of my mentors helped an artist build a gorgeous studio, very expensive studio. And the minute it was finished, she stopped painting. It's almost like the precious canvas or the precious paper. So I think sometimes these constraints we have of limited space, and I've got fairly limited space in here, but I move things around. Uh, but I think that that actually can drive our creativity. Now, one of the things that I think that could be powerful is if you can, if you can have an area, even a tiny area where you have your supplies ready to go, so it's very easy to get into your materials. This is helpful because it's kind of like I, I play cello and, and my cello teacher said that for years she played cello, but it was hard to get her to practice because the cello case was a non-opener. So just even having the case closed made it one more effort to get to that cello. So even with my cello, I've got the case open. I've got that cello ready to go. If you can take even a small space somewhere in your condo and have, have your palette out, have your paints around so that you can mix it quickly. So it's not such a non-starter, but rather an opener and an invitation for you to get in there and get going. So I think that's, that's this is one that comes up for a lot of artists at various points. Linda says, can I apply this to collage, my art? Yes, 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 yes. 
And this can be applied, whether it's collage, whether it's uh, representational painting. I used to paint uh, landscapes, oil landscapes, um, oil figures, and then I started moving towards increasingly abstracted figures. Collage, I did a lot of collage. And all of this relates to all those mediums because we're talking about foundational concepts here that you can translate into these various areas. I also did sculpture. You can bring that in. So you'll learn the big concept ideas like the roots and the trunk of the tree. And you can take those across genres because we're talking about concepts from science and mathematics, simplicity and constraint, combinatorics, all kinds of things that you can bring into your art to help you to really go to that place of experimentation and evolving your art. Because being an artist is not about copying others or yourself. It's not about repeating yourself. It's about continually going to that edge, into the unknown. And part of that is allowing for really uncomfortable so-called ugly art, because that's what fuels innovation. Ugly art, so-called mistakes, so-called failures fuels innovation. There's a beautiful story of this concept of monocook, which means kind of all in one. And it's a concept, it's a French concept. And it was a design concept that was informed single hull boats, some aircraft, some kayaks. And there was a wonderful architect in, in uh, Denmark named Jun Utzen, who years ago was in this contest to try to get the Sydney Opera House, you know, to, to develop, to create, to design the Sydney Opera House. And if he had just gone along like everyone else, only with variations, you know, looked at other people's designs, but slightly different, we, we would get, we wouldn't have gotten the Sydney Opera House. But he did something really compelling and, and amazing. He took a concept, a foundational concept, like the monocoque, which means it's all in one, it's like an egg. The perfect design is an egg with the shell and it's all there, all at once, no seams, it's all together, it's three composed. And he took that concept to architecture. He essentially broke the rules and, and designed the Sydney Opera House, which is probably the most famous modern piece of architecture in the world. And that did not come from emulating others or even emulating what he had done before. This was breakthrough material. And this is where we want to go continually. So artists don't rest on their laurels. Artists are not ruled by rules. And so this is where we want to go as artists, whether you're painting landscapes or figures or creating sculpture or very abstract art, whatever it is, or architecture. It's important to really get that it's about experimentation and the unknown and then evolving that. So, okay, Anna. Anna says, okay, how to be creative when the space in the house is not enough. I get discouraged when I need to take out all the supplies and put them back. Yes, this is like Monica too. So Anna, we were just talking about that. You're discouraged because you cannot leave them out because you just simply don't have enough space. And so, again, if you can somehow create something, you know, the art teachers in, in grade school and, and some, some higher schools have an art cart. They literally have a movable cart and have their materials on the cart. So that might be something you look at. Maybe it's one of those carts from a um, cooking store, something like that a kitchen a store or a, a restaurant supply and maybe put your materials on a cart that you can move around. That might be a possibility. So I hope that's helpful. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> two of you ask about, Linda and, and Barbara want me to expand on 
licking the paint. Well, I've written about that on my blog, so you can also go there, but it's, it always makes me laugh when I say licking the paint. It's about, if you think about someone painting a house, for instance, the inside of the house, that's pretty much licking the paint. We want everything to be perfect. We want it to be smooth and unified and, and nothing, you know, no ridges or anything like that. Another example of licking the paint is when you're creating art and you just keep going in indecisively. And rather than going in with a decisive move and getting out, you keep fiddling with it. And I know that probably most of you have had this experience. I certainly have. And it just eventually turns into mush. And that's not what we want. But it comes from, licking the paint comes from not really um, having the confidence to go in and make a decision. Now, creating is about making decisions. You've got to decide. And sometimes we don't like the decisions we made. But at least we made a decision. And that whole thing gets into the realm of ugly art. But I submit to you that there are massive surprise benefits to ugly art, that this is the birthplace of innovation. And so we actually want to learn to be able to not only tolerate ugly art, but actually embrace it, actually be excited when it shows up. Um, because it's very much about experimentation. Okay, so another person, Colorful, says, that's a good point about repeating oneself. How and what role can mediums play to make this happen? Can you give an example? Okay, uh, colorful, I don't think it's about mediums. This could happen in any realm, repeating oneself, whether you're a sculptor, whether you're an architect, whether you're a photographer, whether you're using watercolor, clay, oil, mixed media, inks, whatever. Um, it's not about the medium, it's about the what's going on he in here, the inner journey. It's about, I think that when, when the repetition happens, what happens is we're, we're going along, we, we finally start, we get going, then we, um, then we start experimenting, we're like, wow, I'm, I'm on fire, this is great, I'm alive. And, and we move off when we experiment, experiment, we move off of emulating others. And we finally start going into these unknown places in the experimentation. And at first that's fantastic. And then pretty soon people start noticing and they love it. Some people at least love it because it's so alive, this art. And then the risk is to fall back on the fear of uh oh, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep winning. I want to keep getting successful paintings. So we get scared, we kind of contract, and we start to just repeat pretty much what we were just doing, what was winning. And I have seen that. There is a very um, fabulous sculptor in the Bay Area, and he was doing these incredible uh, sculptures, figurative, kind of abstract figurative sculptures. He would both build them up, but he also with plaster, but he also would carve away with marble and different materials. <clears throat> and pretty soon, I mean, he got to be very well known, very successful. But pretty soon, what became obvious is he started just repeating what he had already done before. It, each piece was hardly different than the other for years. And so he's repeating that. This also happens. I was talking, I was on a podcast with Jim Rutt and, and Bruce Isle, my partner, about a month or so ago. And we were talking about musicians. And he, he mentioned that so many musicians will become well-known and extremely successful. And then they just repeat what they've done. And he was giving an example of a man who's like 80 years old, who is the opposite of that, who is continually experimenting and evolving. And this is where we want to go. And um, so there are many, many examples of that. And 
it's a big risk continually. And we just have to notice it and go, okay, I see that. Now it's time to really go to that edge again, take some risks, allow the ugly art to emerge because we might want to fall back on this work. Let's just keep doing that. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Sharon says, I will get three fourths done with a painting and truly love it. And then I don't finish because I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it. What can I do for this? Well, Sharon, this brings up a number of different things. Number one is the rhetorical question of, is a painting ever ruined? And I ask that seriously. So one could argue that in some ways it's not because it, that painting came from you. And so the, the impulses, the aesthetic imagination, the experimentation all came from you and it still lives in you. Even if, even if you took that, play, that painting to a place you don't like and you're afraid that it's ruined, still there's something in that painting that's about you. So in a lot of ways, we, we get so worried about ruining paintings. See, this is, this is the perfectionism piece. This is about the inner journey, the psychology, where we're trying to create a successful painting and we want it to be great and then fear sets in. What if I ruin it? Believe me, I've had, I've had that concern numerous times. <laughs> but when you really eventually start to get that, you know what, it's okay, because in some ways I can't really ruin it because I can always create another painting that's informed by where I'm going here. It may not be the exact same of where that was, hopefully it's not, but I'm working out some things here in this series as I'm experimenting and evolving it, and it's okay. And so when you really can, again, embrace the ugly painting, you won't be quite so afraid of ruining your painting. Recognize that that is a kind of perfectionism, a trying to create a masterpiece, which we all grapple with. But, but when we kind of can move past that, it's extremely powerful. So it brought up that. And then the other thing this brings up for me is you say, I don't finish because I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it. That the finishing question is the whole rhetorical thing as well. And I, and I always ask, is a painting ever finished? Uh, because to me personally, my opinion is that no, <laughs> a painting is not finished. It's only stopped where you decide to stop it. You, the artist, the author, the composer, where you decide. But do you understand that a painting could go in a million directions and more. It's actually infinite. And so it really is back to decision. And you can take paintings, you can take them, leave some very raw, take some further and take some even further. And some of them you're not going to love. And that's okay. Because that painting you don't love, you might love 10 years down the road. I've certainly got some of those around here. Sometimes the ones we don't like, we think we've ruined them, are actually quite amazing, but we can't see it at the time because our art sometimes is ahead of us. It's out there in the future. And sometimes it's so unfamiliar that we can't value it at the moment. So these are lots of things we explore or these very questions around, is a painting ever ruined? you know, is a painting ever finished? What does this mean? And so on. So thank you for that question. Um, okay. Charlotte says, I'm in a small condo. Okay. Uh, it sounds like a lot of us have this experience of a small space. I was wondering where do I put all the paper that I'm painting on as I'm creating miles of canvas? I discovered another artist who hangs her drawing, painting, drying paintings on a curtain wire that she got from Ikea. I got it and installed it on a wide wall and it works great to display work and also to have a place to dry. 
Are there any other ideas? Well, I've got miles of canvas around here as well. And one of the things that I do is I roll them up. I've got rolls and rolls and rolls of, of paintings, whether they're on paper or canvas, and I put them in a closet that I have. I've also got some out in my garage. <laughs> so I put them wherever I can, but that's what I do is I roll them up and I roll them together, many of them. So that's, that's how I handle that. Um, okay. Let's see. Laura says, what if you create a piece and someone wants to buy it? It sounds impossible to recreate, which is great because each is original. Uh, but what if someone requests something specific? Sorry if a dumb question. Well, there are no dumb questions, <laughs> Laura. And then you said, by the way, I don't paint to sell. I ended up selling two without even trying. Wow. <laughs> That's great, Laura. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure why one would want to recreate it. Um, oh, but here's the key question, it sounds like. But what if someone requests something specific? Well, here's the thing. That is up to you. That depends upon you. You're the artist, the author, and the composer. And you get to decide whether you want to go down that path of commissions where with the commission someone is requesting certain certain elements from you certain images or certain colors and so on and so forth and that is ultimately up to you so you have to stand in your own two feet as an artist and continually author yourself i generally don't go down that path i think i I did once, but it was with someone who knows me very well, and she already was saying pretty much like what you're already doing is what I want, you know, that kind of thing. But it really is up to you. So um, the problem of falling into the commission piece is when it starts to become dictated by someone outside of you, the artist. So that can become a real problem in terms of pleasing others and looking for external validation rather than standing in your own internal validation and deciding this is what I'm doing. I'm the artist, take it or leave it. So anyway, just some thoughts and, you know, I get it. Some people want to do commissions, but um, you, you have to understand what you're getting into and get really clear about that if, if that's where you're going. So, okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so Monica says, it is very challenging working on big canvases. One can get lost. Well, it, you know, I think it, it depends. Um, I think one of the things you can do if you're feeling like you're getting lost in a big canvas is working with it more and perhaps working with less expensive materials like a paper sometimes can be freeing if you're finding yourself getting lost. I think that that getting lost, if I'm understanding where you're coming from, may be driven by by indecision by um, perhaps fear and that fear can be driven by self-doubt um, also perfectionism and trying to create the masterpiece and so sometimes we're like I don't know what to do but here's the thing it's actually if you can embrace the not knowing when you say I don't know what I'm doing yay because we actually want to be in a place of not knowing. This is the where we're going with this experimentation and evolution involving the art is going to the place of not knowing. So when we're you know, getting on a big canvas or a big paper, we're going in there and we're searching. And this is what we're doing in science as well, searching, okay? 
in, in life, we're searching. We're searching for meaning. We're searching for aliveness. We're searching for expression. And, and a big piece of that is allowing, allowing the, the truth that it lives in you to come through onto your canvas and onto your paper. So I think, you know, this is a very, it's good that it's challenging and it's, it's taking you to these edges. And I would say to you, keep searching and keep allowing yourself to not know where you're going. Um, if that feeling lost, feeling is, you know, fueled by fear, you can talk to yourself. You can embrace ugly art. You can talk to yourself through that fear if that's where that feeling lost piece is coming from. Do you see, do you all see that, why I say that psychology is everything, that your inner landscape, your inner narrative, how you speak to yourself affects your art and life? It affects everything. That's why that's that big overarching concept of the inner journey, because we're continually coming up into it and grappling with it. Um, okay, so, Colorful says, I feel like I understand this concept, but when I put myself to painting, I find it challenging to be mindful of the adjacent possible at all times. Yeah. Uh, is painting regularly going to help with this? I believe it, it will. Are there other types or other tips you can give us to focus on expressing ourselves while we paint? So, yeah, I think that one of the things that I've experienced over the years is that the more you can paint and just get in there and get into your studio, even mixing paint, but the more you get in there, the less precious it becomes, especially when you work in a series so that no one particular painting is, is precious. And, and perhaps this would be helpful for you, Colorful, is working in a series that, um, <clears throat> You know, and, and if you, I think if you come to the canvas with just an experimental attitude of what if, what if I try this, what if I try that, what if I flip this, what if I flip that, whatever, that that attitude will move you into not only experimenting, but evolving. And yeah, sometimes it's not happening. Sometimes we're not, you know, working with the adjacent possible. But I think that the more we get in there and do lots of starts and get in there and experiment, that we start going there because we, we actually start to embrace the ugly art, which actually fuels all of this going to the edge and evolving. And it's an iterative process. And it takes a lot, this is why I talk about miles of canvas, many starts, miles of canvas to overcome the the inner part that would stop us. So I think that this is the, these are the kinds of things that are very helpful. Lots of starts, working in a series, uh, asking yourself what if, allowing for the ugly art. If you had just those concepts in your mind, like actually embracing it and even laughing about ugly art, you will be accessing experimentation and the adjacent possible because that's where you're going to be on that edge, continually moving on that edge. And then in terms of expressing yourself while, while you paint, you have your own signature, your own lexicon, your own truth of your gestures. And a lot of it is about getting out of the way. And getting, getting out of the way is that inner piece of how you talk to yourself. As you will, you allow yourself to get in there and, and really express something on that paper, that canvas. I hope that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> Lynn says, I want to paint abstracts that I would like to have hanging in my house. I rarely paint paintings that I want in my home. I don't understand why. I do not have much trouble starting and experimenting. It is afterwards when I look at what I have done and it doesn't feel finished, but I don't know where to take it. 
Can you help me understand, please? Yeah, that's really, I think, Lynn, that that's coming back to, that's coming back to this whole narrative around finishing and, and some, I'm sensing perfectionism in there, which many of us deal with, that perhaps it's not good enough, perhaps it's not quote unquote finished, whatever. And I think that if we can uh, expand on our ability to, to tolerate expressions that are coming through us and allow those. In fact, I even encourage many of my artists to hang up their so-called ugly art because what we're trying to do is expand the envelope, the repertoire of, of the ability to tolerate really edgy art, art that is breaking the rules, art that is unfamiliar, the art that is coming through you that's trying to trying to evolve and it's it's not necessarily going to be pretty and so i actually think what i'm sensing from what you're saying here is that i'm sensing that you're in this place of starting and experimenting and it's exciting but then you question it then you you don't think it's finished then you won't hang it up and i assert to you that perhaps it could be very powerful for you to experiment with actually taking these ones that you're describing to me and putting them up on your wall. And let's see if you can expand that repertoire of tolerating that and see actually that art might be trying to guide you to a new series. And so I believe it's important to let a lot of this ugly art live and not throw it out, not cover it up, not try to change it because it's actually got messages for you. And so I, I think you might consider that. Uh, Sharon says, where do you get the extended brushes or do you make them? Well, Sharon, those brushes I got long ago and they, let's see, you're talking about this kind of brush, I think. They're very, very thin. They are. They were very inexpensive, and they were plein air, uh, long handle brushes, and they're not making them anymore. And I might get someone to make them, but it's like a big deal apparently to get these long handle brushes. It's. I used to get them. I think it was through Blick or through Jerry's Artorama, but you can't find them. And so one thing you could do is take a brush and just any brush any brush and you could get a dowel and tape it tape it onto a brush and I've done that in workshops I do that so um, just make sure the dowel is strong enough <laughs> so it doesn't break okay just a second what else someone says and I don't see oh Mike Mike said okay so no right or wrong it's about creating right <laughs> hey Mike it is all about creating and art is subjective. It is not science. It is not like, let's, let's put it this way. It's not a mathematical formula or a chemical equation. Art is an expression and it's an expression through the artist and it is subjective. And so it really is yeah, no right or wrong. It's an expression. And so uh, it's important to remember that because I think the judging mind can come in and say, oh, that's not right. Or, oh, I'm supposed to do it this way. Or, oh, I'm supposed to follow these rules. And remember, don't be ruled by rules. If you really want to get on that edge and innovate, you, you can't be ruled by rules. Now you might be informed by rules. Um, <clears throat> just as there are techniques and sure techniques are fun, but they're, they're like the leaves on the tree. They're not the deep core of what this is about. Okay. We use them, but they're not expression itself. So it's, it's kind of like that too. Um, but yeah, it's up to you. 
but I, yeah, I say there is no right or wrong on that. <laughs> okay, uh, just a second. I'm just looking at these questions. Lillian says, how much time would I need to complete the lesson modules in the Studio Journey Masterclass? Well, you know, it all depends because each person is different, but each module, each module has um, a lecture, which is a, a talk with slides, and that might be 30 minutes or something like that. Um, I mean, they vary in length, but let's just say 30 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. And then, so that's the big overarching concept. And then I'll have a reflection, some reflection questions to consider, because we always want to get at why, why is this important? And then we have exercises that I've developed. So they'll typically be two to four exercises and there typically are little videos with that, or it, it might be written up in some of them, but basically, and that really depends upon how long you want to spend on that. It doesn't take long to get through the exercise in terms of reading it and, or listening to it or watching it, but the issue is how much time you put in to the studio on that. And then um, the I do a full painting where I do the full painting so that I can kind of pull out and talk about different aspects of the concept that we're getting at. And that full painting might be 20 minutes to an hour even sometimes, or sometimes there's two of those, but you know. So I would say we're probably talking about two hours of content there for each module, but again, it's about how you um, implement that, how much time you put in, and and you can go along if you've got a busy week, you don't worry about it. You can always loop back around. So the artists in Studio Journey love to come back around again and again and again, revisiting the lessons. And they've said to me that each time they've, they've you know, it's kind of like a spiral. Each time you come around, you're in a new place and you see something in a new way or you experience something in a, in a new way because you've gone through some other material and that informs you and you come back. So I wouldn't worry about the time of it too much, um, but probably to get through the material would be about two hours just to get through it. And then we also will have 10 of the sessions where I'm going to go on and I'll elucidate further further ahas or revelations or, you know, ideas that are coming through that I would like to share with you about that particular concept we are looking at. And that's typically an hour, and that will be on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'm on the west coast of California. So, um, and those, if you can't make it for those, you can always come in and watch the recording. So we have the recordings there. So you can do all of this on your own time and, and at your own convenience, but also you can come join us for those live components too, if you wish. Um, so let's see. Okay, this is interesting. Someone is asking a follow-up question. A gallery, uh, I don't know who this is, a gallery owner I know says, keep up your own style so collectors will recognize your work. You're saying the opposite, right? You know, so yeah, I've been in galleries in Santa Fe and Maui and Dallas and Carmel and Capitola um, and this is, it's very important that you get clear on how you want to deal with this. Because the thing is, is that if you allow someone else to define what is on the menu, then who is the artist? You are the artist. Now I get that 
Sometimes one has a following. I certainly have had a following. But do you want your following to dictate your art? And so I have worked with artists to get what I'm saying here about, you know, if you're really doing your art, you are the author, the composer, and the artist, and you decide what it is. Now, that said, I think that what they might be talking about is a cohesive series. And a series is a fabulous thing. Working in a series is fabulous for many reasons, one of which is that we're, it's about going deeper into whatever it is you're exploring with variations and permutations and evolution of an idea over time. And it could be a few paintings to hundreds in that series. But the series is not going to be that interesting if you're not experimenting and evolving the art. If it is essentially barely different than the last one, I submit to you that that is deadening. It's actually moving into just more trying to perfect something than really evolving something. And if you think about craft is about perfecting something. And art is about evolving and going into the unknown. And that can get uncomfortable. And there will be many people who will try to tell you to, you know, get a style, find a style, continue that style, ad infinitum. And I submit to you that that is a deadening place. Now, I do have some artists who have a quote unquote successful practice, so to speak, of maybe they're painting pet portraits. And that's kind of their bread and butter. So they'll have a body of work that allows for that. That is for someone else to decide what's on the menu. And the person who's deciding is either the collector or the gallery owner, the gallerist, whatever. They're really saying, this is what we want. And you're going, okay, I'll just keep replicating that basically with very a little bit of variation. But but that ultimately, I think, gets deadening and boring. And in what you, you know, if you really want to get into innovation and what art is about of going in deeper and deeper into the unknown and the mystery of you and your life and who you are, you could also absolutely insist to yourself that while okay, I've got this, you know, bread and butter practice over here, and perhaps I'll keep doing that, perhaps I won't, and I'm an artist, I'm experimenting, and I'm going to evolve my art whether anybody likes it or not. And you know what's interesting about that? Is actually what I've found is that a number of artists who have taken that advice and yes, they did their pet portraits, but yes, they also started experimenting, exploring, and going wild with their animals and their art. Actually found a whole new group of people excited about that art. And even sometimes the, the original gallerist was kind of excited. When the artist stands in her own two feet and insists, I'm the artist here. And so I decide. So I, I'm pretty passionate about that, uh, and you may or may not agree, but that's, that's what I think about that. <laughs> the other piece about that is that, um, as I said, I, I, I don't worry about style at all, and I don't encourage artists who work with me to worry about style. Don't be chasing style, okay? That gets terribly reductionist and it's a prison it can imprison you within um expectations of oh this is what i've got to do let me give you some, some examples sean o'connery sean connery sorry um as an actor 
wanted to break out of 007. He was fabulous, but he, he didn't want to be, be pigeonholed as, as that. Leonard uh, Nimoy, you know, in uh, Spock, he, he got pigeonholed as Spock and fought to get out of that repetition. Again, a success disaster. And we've seen this in art too, where someone does something and other people grab onto it, then they want you to keep repeating that. And then you get pigeonholed and you get imprisoned in that. And so as an artist, you've got to insist that you are continually experimenting and evolving and not everyone is going to like your art and you're not even going to like all of it but it will certainly be exciting to be on that edge to be on that edge as an artist um <clears throat> okay let's see what else we've got you all have some great questions here <laughs> okay anna anna says um oh i see mary Lon lonergan's on here yay great to see you hey, that just popped up uh anna said what to do with the ugly pieces i feel discouraged when they accumulate and i have a block to continue working on them well i think this is actually so exciting to me <laughs> so, <laughs> to imagine um you know a big block of a big grouping of these ugly paintings someone was saying to me the other day i'm trying to remember where, where it was because i talked to so many people that she started to fall so in love with the ugly paintings that she wished she could work on other people's ugly paintings <laughs> but i think anna this is about expanding expanding the your tolerance for ugly paintings and then going beyond tolerance to embracing them because i i believe that when you really get the value of these paintings that are, are really bothering you that uh, something's going to break through for you so here's what i would say to you about that if you've got a whole bunch of ugly paintings and you're feeling really really uncomfortable I would ask you to keep some of them, probably keep some of the ugliest ones, okay? Don't do anything to them. And then in another group, take that group and go and go back into them, work back into them, knock them back if you need to, veil, uh, cover, whatever, then go back in, back and forth, okay? And then on the last grouping, is go even further, maybe lots and lots of layers. I have a dear friend, uh, Lorraine Willis. We were on a phone call. She's one of my guest teachers who's going to be on here. And we were talking about ugly art and how one of the things that Lorraine has been doing recently is getting a gigantic canvas, putting it up on her wall. And every time she paints, she puts some paint on this. And she said, this thing is getting uglier and uglier. And it's got so many layers, it's unbelievable. But what Lorraine is doing is expanding her repertoire of being able to tolerate and embrace ugly art. So there is a method to my madness here. And those of you who have worked with me before, and I see that some of you are on here, know what I'm talking about. So Anna, I would say, try not to be discouraged. In fact, be excited that you've got ugly art and recognize that th there's that there's something in these pieces that will show up later on that these you heard me say that i believe that ugly art is often the nascent embryonic form or forms of new work trying to emerge new art trying to be born but often we can't see it or recognize it at the time. And that ugly piece, sometimes down the road, you'll see it show up again, a certain, cer certain moves or something is akin to that ugly piece. It's trying to be the kernel of something that's going to inform a series. And this is where innovation lives. Okay. Um,
Okay. Juan L says, how many hours do you recommend a student spend each day to successfully glean from your program? Is there a fixed number of hours? There isn't, Juan L, I'm not, there's not, you know, I'm very kind of open and uh, I'm not regimented. <laughs> And I think that it really depends upon the person. I think I ideally one would get into one studio every day, even just a little bit, even if to mix paint, even if to just write in your art journal, that would be ideal. But I get that sometimes that doesn't happen. And I think that if you could get in and work on this material every week, at least for you know, two to five hours a week, you will really see movement and evolution of your art. And of course there are times that are, you know, bad days or whatever, but, but I think it's like, it really is getting those miles of canvas, all, you know, in there and, and really putting the time in. It's like this and everything pretty much. Uh, but I think a few hours a week, two to five probably would be really good. And let's see. Elizabeth says, my goal is to create children's picture books. However, I feel as though I am forever starting, starting ideas of books and then going on to the next idea and not following through with the first one. How do you move beyond starting any art forever? Oh yeah. Well, you know, I too, this is Elizabeth Burns. I also write books. <laughs> And so um, <clears throat> I think that that's all, with, with the writing of books, that the kind of stopping like that, the kind of you start something and then you kind of veer off and perhaps get distracted or don't take it through in terms of the book to completion of that work that you want to do. In other words, this is where I'm taking it. Again, is any book ever finished? No. Is any art ever finished? No. But at some point we decide this is where I'm stopping. And sometimes we're, you know, this can be related to fear and doubt. Again, it gets back to the inner that informs um, taking it through. And I'm working on two books right now. And so I know, I know what you're talking about here because it's easy to veer off and do something else. And um, sometimes it helps to have someone, particularly if you're writing books and you're illustrating books, but you're working with books to have accountability with someone. So having another writer or another book illustrator to talk to and feed off of and you know back and forth is helpful to go ahead and take that to publication so that's a little bit different than painting in the sense that we don't necessarily have to uh, publish a painting so to speak you can do what you want with the paintings you can also do what you want with the writing but if that's where you're going with it I think it'd be good to have someone to help you kind of stay accountable. S some kind of support oftentimes is very helpful. And this is one of the things in, in the master class. We have such supportive people in there, amazing people who help encourage you to keep going. Okay. So yeah, you were saying I'm pretty good at starting stories and illustrations, but not finishing. Yeah, that's my sense, Elizabeth, is to get support to push through whatever that, maybe it's self-doubt that's holding you back from finishing that up and getting that out there. Um, okay, I'm just looking to see if there's anything else. I think, let me just see if I can see anything else here. I was seeing Mary Lonergan in here. Um, and anyway, I think, I think I've got it. I really en enjoyed being here with you all. These questions are fantastic. And if you have more questions, you know, write to us at support at nancyhillis.com and we could get something together on that. 
Mary says, thank you. This was great. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, all of you. I really appreciate you being here, all of you. And Anna says, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate all of you. <laughs> so, uh, oh, that's okay. Somebody said, you all, I got to tell you, my eyes are really bad. So I apologize for getting so close to this thing, but Oh, thank you, Julia. You are amazing. Thank you. I appreciate all of you. Um, somebody had one last question. My eyes are bad. Let's see. How many years does it take to be a real artist? Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think that, you, you know what? You are an artist, all of you. And it's you decide you define yourself no one outside of you defines you you decide you've got to claim it i believe that we are all creative and that there comes this point when we finally say i am an artist and you're the only one who can decide that but i submit to you that you are if you are doing art, and this came up in one of my Facebook lives in one of my groups, I think it was the Studio Journey group. If you are creating and expressing yourself in, in various media mediums, you are an artist by definition. And so you, in terms of a real artist, you have to claim that. And I think that an artist is simply someone who is creating. And I believe going on that edge, going to that edge continually. So I, I encourage you to believe in yourself and call it, claim yourself as an artist. You decide that. So I appreciate all of you, Libby, all of you. I'm just kind of scrolling through. Again, I, appreciate, I, um, I just really, yeah, I just really appreciate you all. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you for your kindness. And I will love reading through this afterwards, your comments. And I encourage you to go forward. We would love to have you in the Studio Journey Masterclass. It's going to be so much fun. And if you have any questions whatsoever, just write to us at support at nancyhillis.com. And we'll also get the replay out for you as well. So thank you. And I'll see you soon.